the first presenter uh, will be Kiran Nada, who is, of course, the chairperson of the Kiran Nada Museum of Art, KNMA, and a trustee of the Shif Nada Foundation. Besides being an avid art collector, all of, most of us, of course, know that she is an acclaimed international bridge player and a philanthropist. She is a key driver behind demystifying art for the common people through her museum, the KNMA. She has been acknowledged as a hero of philanthropy, shouldn't it be heroine of philanthropy, by the Forbes Asia magazine in 2010 for launching India's first philanthropic private museum. Kiran is a trustee of the Shiv Nada Foundation, an organization committed to transformational educational initiatives. She is a member of the Rasaja Foundation and a member of the International Council of MoMA in New York. Uh, the presenters. Rajiv Jahangir Chowdhury is a collector of Indian art and founder of Sansara Capital. Uh, which offers investment services and solar energy uh, generation. Uh, the more detailed uh, bio is, is in the handout. Uh, Taimur Hassan, who hails from London, uh, also collects South Asian and Middle Eastern modern and contemporary art, and is the founder of Freire Hall Capital Management, a hedge fund that trades commodities. Dara K. Mehta is, of course, another avid art collector and managing director of the financial services firm Dara Shaw & Company, Private Limited. And without further ado, I would like to invite Ms. Kiran Nada. I'm delighted to be at Asia Society in New York today. And I would first like to start by congratulating Bunhui and Zera on putting together this fantastic curatorial project, and I'm happy that we could support it and loan some works to this exposition. Collecting the modern has been the subject of, or is the subject of the panel discussion today, and is where, in fact, my journey into art as a collector began some decades ago. Collecting the modern is about a response to a particular time, a phase in Indian history that is exciting at many levels. For instance, close to India's independence and the formation of an India, independent India was the formation of the Progressive Artist Group in Bombay, a moment that marks India's political and cultural freedom from the colonial rule. Parallel to the new nation-born was a freshly formatted artist group that came together to address the need for a modern language in art that would suit the temper of their times. It was a time to evolve new vocabularies and address with urgency the theme of nation building and identity. Souza, Hussein, Raza, Ara, and Gade were the young artists who mostly belonged to a minority groups who gravitated to Bombay to chase their dreams and take on the struggle, head on to pursue art, making, making it in the metropolis. Each one of them was a strong individual and was seeing the world around him with his own eyes. I came to know some of them personally through the years. They were indeed a magnificent generation of painters, each one seeking his own identity identity and voice through the art practice. Hussein Saab became a good friend and used to visit our home in Delhi. In fact, I had first commissioned him to do some works for our new residence. And he would frequently drop in and get onto a stool and repaint the outlines of the work because sometimes he felt the color wasn't right. And it was, it was, really, a, it was really a source of Great entertainment to see him do that. Entertainment may be the wrong word, but that's what comes to mind. Subsequently, once he left India, we still met uh, in London and in Dubai and in Doha. And in fact, I last met him two weeks before his death. He was an amazing man with a tall and charming persona and had a penchant for good food and stylish cars. Raza Saab was more soft-spoken, quiet, and aloof when I met him. He was, of course, a lot older. 
I was, he was felicitated by the Shivnada University in 2016 for his incredibly, for his incredible journey and was uh, given a PhD. The exploration of modern abstraction through Indian, Indian philosophies and the spiritual treaties was an important point that he contributed. I did not know Souza personally, but I learned a lot about him from friends who shared the rebels' aggressive and temperamental persona with me. The wise orator and loud voice of the group, he could indulge in a fight at the drop of a hat. His rage and angst transformed into expressionist fury that animated his distorted and grotesque figures. There were others, Ara, Gade, and Bakri, and the associates, V.S. Gaitonde, Tayyab Mehta, Akbar Padamsi, Ram Kumar, and Krishan Khanna. Their camaraderie took the form of letters that they, were, that they wrote to each other for decades, some of which have been published by the Raza Foundation, and some we have as part of our archives. Collecting the modern, which was initially the core focus of mine as a collector, con continues to be an exhilarating experience for me. I'm still excited seeing their works. In fact, some of the works at this show have been an eye-opener because they're works that I had not seen before. And I am really heartened to see new works come up where I can still consolidate my uh, the, the, um, the modern that I have. I keenly follow their works, be it in auctions, offered by private collections or galleries or from individual collectors. I would like to mention here the three sterling figures, Souza, Raza, and Hussein. As part of this presentation, I have shown some of the works that we showed in a brilliantly curated exhibition at KNMA by Rubina Karode, titled Stretch Terrains, which had a string of exhibitions examining the modern in the Indian context. But a multidisciplinary and multimedia thrust through paintings, drawings, and prints, photographs, architectural models, and films. 90% of this extensive show with more than 350 works was from the KNMA collection. I'd just like to dwell on a few works of Souza's. Souza's family is an extraordinary painting in the KNMA collection, showing through the painting or a window a feast that is laid out while the farmer's family after hard work's labor are seated in front of a bowl of rice, which is being eyed by a greedy toad. I was drawn to the way Souza painted the big, tough hands and the rough feet of laboring families, expressive of their hard labors in the field. The man and woman, woman grinding their teeth, which is another painting, are characteristics of characteristic, characteristic of Souza's vocabulary with eyes sitting inside the head and darts piercing the figure as they grind their teeth with anger. The Souza exhibition in stretch terrain had worked such as The Butcher, The Family, Mr. Sebastian, Birth, and, some, and several others showing for the first time in India. Birth is quite a remarkable painting, both in the imagery and color treatment. I find it, I find in it both tenderness and an, an, an uneasy, unsettled ambience. The man sitting next to a woman giving birth in India itself makes for an unusual visual image. Susan and Raza are both masterminded impasto, using the brush and knife and used it generously in their paintings. M.F. Hussain, the rooted nomad, focused on the maverick spirit, his walking nation barefoot, comprehending India as a rich cultural mosaic, 
his assimilated character with many religious religions, languages, and stories. His painting celebrated the rural and folk sensibilities that coexist in urbanized India. The modern for him could not be conceived without the fertile and rustic colors that symbolize Indian myths and sensibilities. His composite style of painting combined aspects of Urdu poetry, epic narratives, folk, Hindu Islamic symbols, Devanagari script, and modern literary characters. This was the India he represented, and to believe in it, a nation that his paintings created that spirit and identity. We have in the show a, a work titled Yatra of Hussein's, which is quite an epic work. The Raza works from his early period were landscapes and cityscapes, specific to specific locations and cities. In India and then in Paris, he, in India and then in Paris, he left India and stayed in Paris in France for more than 60 years of his life. His cityscapes and towns in France are depositions and gradually the human figure was absented from his practice altogether. His abstraction for, uh, lasted for many more years and distilled it as he moved from a natural to a symbolic representation of the Bindu, Bhumi, Rajasthan, Saurashtra, as he wanted the West to realize that his abstraction was embodied with philosophical content. What I enjoy in Raza is his saturated colors that almost vibrate and make his canvases palpable. It was an experience learning to engage with Guy Tonde's work that have a mistiness about them and are about silent communication. What I started and enjoyed most in Guy Tonde is the purity of the contemplative style and the absence of a narrative or ready-made context. It is about learning to engage in visual imagery. Ram Kumar, Thayya Mehta, Akbar Padamsi, and Krishan Khanna were close associates of the Bombay Progressives. And I have just shown three seminal works created in the same year, 1957, as Ram Kumar's vagabond from his distinctive phase, phase Thayya Mehta's Man and the Horse, quite different from his later epic style, and Gade's The Doll's House. Several of these works created during the period were about the common man and the predicament of everyday life. We see these artists painting beggars, laborers on a construction site, farmers, sweepers, and so on. Krishan Khanna's famous Rama Kadhabu is about a tea stall where the ordinary people spend chai, a bit like our prime minister, listening to gossip and reading newspapers or just relaxing after a hard day's work. These works suddenly carry the temper of the time and reveal the preoccupation of these artists. Lastly, coming to the gray, uh, gray nude, I rem uh, remember Akbar Padamsi got to see this painting at KNMA in one of the earlier exhibitions, and he was delighted and said to me, I always wanted to, s to see this painting come back to India, and I'm really excited that it's being exhibited here for my people to see it. This continues to be my passion, to bring home some of the extraordinary works of these artists that were left behind when they returned to India after their stint in Paris or New York. Though I've been a great admirer of Bombay progressives and the radical approach to art making in the early 50s, and, there, and therefore I have not restricted myself to collecting only these names that do the rounds at times in circuits of auctions. I have, extreme, I have extensively collected the obra of Nasreen Mohammadi, Himat Shah, Jairam Patel, Somnath Thor, Ganesh Pine, and Ganesh Holoy, who in my mind 
are unparalleled names in the history of modern Indian art. I am glad that such an extensive exhibition is happening in this part of the world where it might be important to rethink India and its artistic practice after independence and how the progressives revolution opened simultaneously several doors and discourses for successive generations after this extraordinary group of artists. Thank you. So, we have quite an extraordinary gathering here, a, a sort of representation of, in a sense, the globality of the, the Indian modern. You know, Taimur from London, uh, Kiran, of course, from Delhi, from Mumbai, from uh, New York as well. Uh, and I think that's a very sort of interesting combination that we have here. And uh, Kiran, of course, is, is, put, is very, very, in a sense, unusual and really a pioneer in the sense that your museum really is the first sort of public philanthropic uh, museum for modern and contemporary Indian art. And, and it's in such an accessible sort of area. And to think that that came out from a private initiative from your own sort of collecting and what you described earlier, your, your sort of passion uh, for, for, for the artist. So uh, I, I want to come back to, to that towards the end of the presentation because you know, it, it's such a long and complex history. But now I want to go back to the beginning, to this, this, this idea of collecting and you know, uh, some of the questions that people always ask me about collecting, of course the most obvious one is, as long-time collectors, how did you first start? What was that first moment that you decided you were not going to buy a car, a house, a piece of jewellery, and you were going to buy you know, this, this, this piece of, of art? You know, maybe we start from Kiran. Well, I started by collecting for my house. Mm. I was building a home and I wanted... When, when was that, Kiran? Uh, that was in 1990. Mm or 1989. I had bought a few paintings before that, but nothing in real seriousness. And that's the time that I uh, decided to buy, but it was with no idea of setting up a museum or collecting in, yes. in the way that I do today. I just wanted to buy art for myself, and I had no uh, art education, no background of art education. Mm. So it was all sort of self-learned and things that I liked and the, the yeah. intuitively. So that's how I started collecting. Mm. But soon I had more work than I had wall space for. Yes. And that's when I, uh, the idea of doing something more serious uh, and maybe starting a museum came up. But that was at least 10, 12 years later. 10 years later, later. I think it's yeah. 2010, right? Yeah, we started yeah. 2010, I think the thought started. Uh, early. 2004 or five. Ah, so it took five, five years for me to yeah. start. In America, it takes more than six years to build <laughs> a museum. So it's quite, quite an achievement. And, and, and it's interesting, Kiran said exactly uh, what a lot of people describe, that you become a collector when you run out of walls <laughs> to feel. Then you, 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 it's not about decorating your home anymore. Yes. There's no reason. You're buying for, for uh, another uh, other purpose, you know. So, what about Taimur? Um, I, I started collecting about, well, 10 years ago, I, I moved into a new house and I had no furniture, I had empty walls, and a friend of mine um, wanted to introduce me to, I'm from Pakistan originally, to another friend from Pakistan who lived on the same street mm. and who just got her first job at an auction house and she promptly showed up with her catalog for her sale in two days <laughs> okay. um, and, and filled up my walls with, with everything she was selling. So, um, but, but exactly the same thing um, oh. as Kiran described. So you, you start with an interest and it, it sort of becomes um, consuming. Almost. So of the modern, which was the first artist in that moment that interested you? Obviously the most decorative one, um, <laughs> given, given, uh, given a lack of education or background. Um, but no, I, I, I had really good guidance from the start. I think one of the, one of the best things about um, collecting was the people you get to meet through it and mm. the people you become friends with through it. So, and, and by virtue of being in London, many of the artists themselves, the contemporary artists live in London, um, a lot of the gallerists, um, mm. a lot of the curators are in London and you know, having friends in the space, um, that the, seeing things through their eyes, meeting them, um, really got me started and, and 
So one of the first artists I collected, obviously I, I come from Pakistan, so my collection started with Pakistani modern artists, um, would be Sadiqan, who's yes. sort of the most prolific um, of the Pakistani moderns. Yeah. But you, you know, I've, I've seen a bit of your collection and you, you seem to also love somebody you know, like Souza, who's very, very different from. I, I find the, I generally correct with a, with a historical bias. I studied a lot of cultural and intellectual history at college, South Asian cultural and intellectual history at college. And I find that whole, the first generation after independence, after partition, um, both in South Asia, but also in the other um, colonial areas in the, in the Middle East, really interesting how they're building their own identity, yeah. um, using um, a, for, a form, um, uh, using forms um, that, that were not prevalent um, or that, that were not taught to them at their own art schools um, and yet at the same time going back to something historic and there's a, there's a similarity in theme, in, in style also between many of these artists. The Indians and Pakistanis of course had met and had mm. many, many of them had been educated in the same institutions but also in Iran and in Iraq they were using similar themes, similar styles. Um, and I just found that that the art of that generation across many of these countries really spoke to me. Mm. Because it, it has a kind of form and, and you're, you're perfectly right. I mean, you know, aside from South Asia, if you look at China, Japan, you know, the Middle East, Southeast Asia, usually that first generation after independence, one of the, the, the common sort of threads is this, this idea that that generation of artists was celebrating the new nation because, uh, you know, as, as colonies, as former colonies of of Europe or, or, or new nations that were under the sway of, of the European uh, sort of empire, so, so to speak, that being a nation is not a, a gift that was given to them. You know, it came to a, a period of struggle. So the, this act of wanting to validate and celebrate this new sort of identity, new independence, is something that I think is very, very shared. Certainly in Southeast Asia, where I work, you know, it's a very great theme. So turning to, to Dara, what was your, what, what brought you, what was your first work? Why did you do it? Okay, so just before we come to the first work, I mean, uh, my parents loved art. We had only three paintings growing up, but luckily one of them is the finest Hussein horses that I've seen till today, which my dad got from Pandols for 1500 bucks, and possibly the finest Ara still life that we got from a family friend, Bill Chaudhry, who was India's first great collector. Mm. And when we went abroad, we never went to amusement parks or whatever, so my parents would at 14 <coughs> tell me, okay, take your sister to the Louvre or the mm. National Gallery, show her around. And went to college, my brother Baman said, oh, a friend of ours has started working in a, or her friend is, uh, knows a gallerist, so let's go. Mm. So we walked in, we saw a Heber, thought about it for a day, bought the Heber, the only Heber we yet have, and uh, started from there. Mm. So, but it's also been, uh, so I was, what, 19 when we bought the first painting? Wow. Okay. And then because of work and other commitments, there was a long lull in between. And on and off, my office was in Fountain, clients were in Fountain, so whenever we were passing, Pandol Art Gallery was in the middle, so if you dropped in, saw something like something, you bought it. <laughs> but I would say seriously collecting is once we could send money abroad, which yes. wasn't allowed. Yeah. So I would say 2006, my brother-in-law started buying art after seeing us, and then I said, Oops, he's starting to get some, we better get cracking again. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, that competitive element yeah. as well. And I would say Masuza landscape was the first serious painting that we bought. Mm. Actually, it was a few lots after we underbid the famous Gaiton Day that yes. Rajiv has. Ooh. So, <laughs> which is yet one of my favorite paintings. Yeah. And from the so wrong time to buy price wise, but right time to buy. I think quality works. Mm -hmm. And so it's been, I think, nearly 28 years of buying and mm -hmm. 12, 13 years. Mm -hmm. And again, self-taught, I buy a lot of books on art and I read none of them. But what I do do is that I go through and you see all the pictures, you see all the great works, so you get a fair understanding of what attracts you, what doesn't. Mm -hmm. Earlier, and when you started, you thought, oh, would I ever one day own at least one painting by each of these guys? You never thought that you'd be lucky enough to have multiple. Mm. And that's because it's a family thing. My parents, my brother have supported this, I can't say passion anymore, it's a bit of an obsession, but <laughs> that's where it's reached. Yes, yeah. So, and Rajiv, and, and 
you know, speaking as someone who has been not in India, but actually, you know, collecting here uh, in New York. Although um, I actually probably purchased my first work of art as a poster from the NGMA uh, in Delhi. So growing up in Delhi, um, as a kid, I think I was a mutant because among my friends, mostly boys, uh, I was the only one who wanted to spend time in the NGMA or the National Museum. And, uh, uh, and for me, art was not, uh, I wouldn't have known words to describe it, uh, but I was drawn to art uh, before I knew why and how. But now, I, as I look back, uh, I think for me, art was a refuge, a place for contemplation and meditation and, uh, and relaxation, a way to both connect with the past, you know, with human civilization in the past, but also to connect with genius. And, um, uh, and, and, and those two ideas, connecting with the past and connecting with genius, you know, carried over when I uh, moved to the United States and was actually able to access you know, some of the world's greatest museums. Um, so I actually learned about uh, global art, just visiting museums, you know, growing up in uh, Boston and then uh, New York, and then of course traveling to Europe and elsewhere. And um, so I developed this, uh, uh, this worldview that, the, uh, that art from all civilizations and all cultures and all ages and all countries are my heritage. So when I looked at Egyptian art, I didn't look at it as somebody else's art, I looked at it as my own art, uh, as uh, art representing the common heritage of mankind. And, um, you know, and I was going about my life happily enjoying art, never expecting to actually own a work. Uh, but eventually, you know, you work in, on Wall Street long enough, you are able to afford art and uh, afford to buy art. And uh, when that moment came in my life, which was perhaps 25 years ago, I knew uh, I was ready without knowing uh, that uh, I was uh, meant to be a collector. I was ready to be a collector because my eye had been trained on the best art from the best uh, museums all around the world. And I chose to focus on Indian art. You know, you can say partly for obvious reasons, uh, because I'm Indian, uh, but also because uh, uh, I felt that it was possible back then, I think it still is, but certainly it was possible back then to build a world-class collection of Indian art. So my goal always was to focus on building a museum quality collection because that's how I trained my eye uh, on art. It was always about connecting with important uh, civilizational ideas, but also connecting with genius. Uh, and um, the progressives uh, became a, a special focus area for me because they came to represent for me both uh, a very important moment in India's life, which is the birth of modern India, uh, and, uh, uh, and they were geniuses. You know, uh, there were not that many of them, but each of them was super talented in terms of uh, uh, their, their, uh, uh, their artistic talent. Coming to, uh, just, uh, just to finish up, um, one of the first works, not the first uh, work of the progressives, but one of the first works that I bought that, um, uh, that I want to mention is actually upstairs. It is by Krishan Khanna. Uh, it is a 1950s work. It's the flute player uh, and it's the four musicians around him. Uh, I've actually purchased that work from uh, Tom Keane, who, uh, as uh, Boon Hui mentioned, uh, was a representative of the Rockefellers in India in the 1950s and, and 60s. So, uh, so he was helping the Rockefellers build their art collection, but he was also buying art for himself. Uh, and he had purchased this work directly from Krishan Khanna, he, apparently for 500 rupees um, uh, back in the 50s. And, uh, and years later, uh, you know, I purchased it from, from him. It's a stunning piece. It was also on the cover of uh, an HMV album back in the 1960s. So um, you, should, you should check it out. So Chattel, uh, I don't know whether... Christian's family is here. She tell Christian his painting was hit once, really hit, you know, like with it being on a, on a, on a sort of album. And, and Rajiv, with Rajiv, it's a, it's a good time to segue into actually my next question to, you know, once you, you started and the, the sort of passion became an obsession, as Dara says, you know, what, what was in your mind or what, drew, what were the considerations you had as to what your collection would look like? Was there a kind of end point that you, you, you sort of felt, or was it a kind of organic 
like you're having fun with this process of 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 uh, of uh, collecting. Okay, so just to I mean, first you bought art for a number of years, and then mm. suddenly someone turned around and said, "Oh, you collect the progressives." And I was like, "No, I just buy the artists that I like." Mm. Coincidentally, every single of one of them happened to be a progressive. Mm. I think we were also lucky that a lot of their good works were coming to the market. Mm. Uh, their prices were rising, which made people sell earlier than the other artists. Yeah. So there was never a plan that you want one work from each period or stuff like that. Yeah. But then I would say, after a time, then you thought, okay, if I have a good work from this period, then I don't have from that period. But if you don't like the period, there's no point buying because yeah. you're not setting up a museum. I mean, yes, you're doing it eventually for what you love, what attracts you. Um, and I think, yeah, one thing is after a period of time, you get the confidence because I've, you make, everyone makes mistakes, but as long as your mistakes are few. Mm. And I think the best thing is when people say that you've made mistakes and they actually turn out to be right a few years later, that gives you the confidence to really go out and get what you want, mm. difficult as it is with people like this sitting here bidding <laughs> against you. <laughs> And then you really have to stretch. And I think it's better to stretch and get a great, great, great work yeah. rather than have many nice works. Yeah, yeah. I think one of the, the, the demonstrations, so to speak, of what you have precisely said, the passion and the, you know, really the search for quality is I think this show and, and some of the works come definitely from people at, sitting at this panel right now. You know, personally, I was very delighted, and I think Zara knows that because I've said that many times, that the, the extremely high quality works by Ara that we've been able to, to you know, loan and, and, and show in this exhibition uh, upstairs, you know, and one from Rajiv from, from you and that spectacular 1949 work from Kiran, and, and, you know, that's quite a kind of delightful thing that is not just the, the, the more famous, you know, Hussein and Souza. That, you know. In fact, when Boone came to my house and then he said, mm, I don't think Ara, we haven't found uh, work good enough. I don't think he's good enough to be in the show. <laughs> and then I said, okay, maybe you'd like to see these two. And so that's a gratifying thing. And one other thing, Boone, on a side matter, you guys have really done an outstanding job. I have to admit that when I walked through yesterday, I was pretty emotional. Thank you. Thank you. Try, Zara and I try. Where's yeah, Zara? <laughs> I completely cannot see you. you at all. See she's hiding at the back because she's resting from uh, us working her so hard earlier. Um, and then Kiran? Well, since I started with just collecting yes. uh, for the house, etc., but once I started growing the collection, um, it was, I think, much later that I decided I was going to collect in depth. Mm. And since my focus was on the moderns, it continued to be the moderns that I kept my focus on. Mm. And uh, so today the collection, even though I have at the Museum of Collection, a collection of over 5,000 works today, the emphasis of the works is still strongly uh, with the moderns. Mm. And when I look at the moderns, even today, let's say I go through an auction catalogue, my focus is on the moderns and to see works that I don't have that are represented in my collection. Mm. And if I find a work that is unusual and not part of a period or a, uh, that I feel will complement the collection I have, always try and add that work to the collection. Mm. So even though today I have a more encyclopedic collection, I do collect contemporary and other artists, I would still say my focus is on the modern. Mm. And mm. I think uh, if you look at the collection, you'll find that that's where the focus is. I think you, you, you use like the, the word that I was going to use to describe your collection, that you really 
because you know the the endpoint was having this public museum you yeah. know? so I think you're quite unusual in that uh, your collecting is quite en encyclopedic and comprehensive you know which is why you know I highly encourage those of you who have never been to the KMMA uh, especially our, our friends in America do take the chance to go because in the years actually leading up even when I was in Singapore before I came to New York, the, the joy of going, particularly during the Delhi Art Week, you know, during the art fair period, was always there would be a kind of monographic or survey exhibition at Kiran's uh, museum that was very educational to someone who was new, you know, and, and, and uh, you know, I say, I've said in the acknowledgement that, you know, thank goodness, like, you know, while we're doing this exhibition that you see upstairs that we benefited from the years of, in a sense, a kind of acclimatization to the, the panorama of Indian modern art that we saw in, that I personally saw in, in Kiran's show over the years, you know, and, and, uh, and they've always been very generous even before I came because every time I'll call on them and say I'm a curator and they will pile me with catalogs. <laughs> uh, so you learn. So it's a different kind of collecting because once you collect comprehensively, then the collection, other than being aesthetic, it becomes a very strong kind of educational resource because you're getting a kind of map. You're, trying, you're, you're having a collection that, in a sense, has links to each other, whether it's the chronology or thematics uh, or, or com comparative sort of reasons. Then time one. Yeah, so I, I think um, I, I tend, to, tr tend to see things as, as an amateur historian or amateur art historian, so my apologies to the real professional um, academics. Um, I, I, you just start reading and learning um, and, and trying to find contemporary material from mm. the time. Uh, and I'm generally drawn to things that I think um, or perhaps wrongly uh, from time to time, is relevant to, to the history of the period, either the political, the cultural, or, or the mm -hmm. art history um, of the time. And, and it actually becomes a, collecting art and paintings for me became a segue into starting to collect um, first initially photography, then objects, furniture, maps, um, so on and so forth. So um, it, it actually builds uh, and, and starts feeding other interests as well and, and takes you to other forms of collect mm -hmm. collecting. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in, in terms of your, your uh, each of your your sort of collecting, do you, um, in in a sense, do you, if you yourself were to look at your collection, other than it being very strong in 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 the moderns or the progressive, do you see any particular theme or subject or, or you know, I mean, Kiran talked about how you particularly loved, you know, you were highlighting Sousa. In your thing, could you say a bit about whether you know? And we saw, you know, of course, the great the, all the Sousas in your in in Timor's uh, plays. You know, what why emotionally? I mean, why were you particularly drawn to this particular artist or this particular uh, kind of style? Well, I think I feel drawn to Sousa because of his raw energy. Mm. I think he expresses. Um, energy in a completely honest fashion and I think he's able to hit a chord mm. within most of us or at least within me definitely um, that is both emotional and yet uh, one can relate to his angst mm. and and what he's trying to express mm. it's very intense it's mm. it's very intense and it's very demonstrable. I mean, mm -hmm. his energy is there for you to see. Mm. And the rawness of his work appeals to me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, I think the, uh, someone who sees a lot of, who sees a Sousa, encounters a Sousa painting that, that precisely Kiran said it correctly, that kind of intensity and that kind of emotiveness, I think you do react to it, even if you don't know the artist yeah. or, or, so, or, or, or... So, so Boon Hui, yeah. uh, I would say what Kiran just said in a slightly different way. Uh, over time, my collecting shifted to focusing on what I would call difficult works. Mm. And you know, Sousa is not, uh, is Sousa, uh, many of his great paintings are actually difficult. They're not exactly what you'd use to decorate your home. 
So uh, that uh, that you, you, you that, did. I was going uh, to. That's the story say. I was going to tell you. So uh, <laughs> there's this very large Sousa, um, you know, woman undressing or dressing yeah. uh, upstairs. You know, the background is uh, is red, and uh, it's a fiery it's a fiery painting, and uh, and I actually acquired it uh, uh, from the estate um, shortly after he passed away, and uh, my wife who's sitting right here, uh, you know. Uh, she was. She had misgivings about the painting, uh, but you know she was. Uh, her misgivings spilled over when I said I actually want to put it in our foyer, um, and uh, it's a. It, it, as you'll see, it's a very fiery painting, uh, but we put it in our foyer. Uh, over time, not only did uh, both of us get very used to it, but now it is a fixture in our living room, and um, people come and see it, and uh, they love it. Uh, so, um, uh, so the amazing thing about Souza is that you know he he makes the difficult uh, uh, also accessible in his own way, and his energy transfers to you, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, and related to you know to uh, uh, to difficulty. I think the other thing that has interested me is artists who are uh, who are. Symbolically or uh, or implicitly, um, uh, representing some kind of political idea, uh, and um, uh, and I think the progressives, uh, in their own ways, in different ways, uh, they were representing um, a, a pol the political idea of uh, or the artistic uh, counterpart to the Indian constitutional uh, revolution. You know, now Indians don't talk about their constitution as a revolution, which is a, a shame because. You know, the Indian Constitution is just as much of a revolution as the American uh, Constitution was. You know, we focus on our freedom struggle against the British as the primary uh, narrative of that period. But really, the freedom struggle would have meant nothing if they hadn't come up with the Constitution that created a multicultural India. Uh, and the political multiculturalism that is embedded in the Indian Constitution was, symbol was re ex expressed in art, by the artists who came to, uh, to uh, uh, you know, who came to being in that same period, which is the progressives, you know, whether they were Muslims, whether they were Christians, whether they were Hindus, they were reaching into the common past that they found in India. Souza's voluptuous nudes hark back to Hindu temples, uh, for example, uh, and uh, and then of course, you know, they embraced themes and and ideas that they. That they took from Europe or uh, or Zen Buddhism from Asia, you know. So they were fearless in taking good ideas and uh, and making them their own from wherever they got them, uh, and uh, and in some sense, in in a very fundamental sense, they represented the artistic multiculturalism that uh, you know that was uh, a, a sort of a mirror image of the politi political multiculturalism that the Indian Constitution represented. And uh, to me, that is also very, very significant about the, uh, the progressives. Mm -hmm. So the two Ps, passion and politics. Passion and politics. <laughs> Dara? Good boon if I can add, because I think uh, Rajiv, as he said, has lived abroad, gone to museums, been more exposed than we were when we started. I think one thing that you cannot discount is happenstance and luck. Mm. One day someone said, oh, you've got quite a strong collection of Akbar, and he's your favorite artist. I was like, no, and suddenly I turned around and there happened to be quite a few. Mm -hmm. And that's how it started. And now you <laughs> actually really, really stretch to get whatever great Akbar you can. Yes. And then you'll try and build it up. But you never started by saying, oh, I'll do Akbar Padam C or I'll do X or I'll do Y. Yes. So that little bit of luck of what is available, are others going for it? Can you afford it? Do you have the money at that time? You cannot discount that, yes. I think, so that's very important. And the other thing is, you know that somewhere you're on the right track, the more your friends come, they like certain stuff, mm. you're just surprised, and then, mm. you know, you have a Sousa crucifixion with this horrendous face to them, and then mm. they, or you have something that's abstract, and they say, for a guy one day, oh, I could do it, my son could do it, my kid <laughs> could do it. <laughs> and it's I, a curse I, of abstract <laughs> artists. So I've always thought that I, maybe I should just keep a canvas and some oils yes. and tell them, okay, can you just do it? <laughs> <laughs> that's a good, that's a good, that's okay. a good tip, people. And, <laughs> yeah, and the other thing is, so slowly, slowly, as 
if you're going to museums like Rajiv said, your eyes going to be trained, yeah. you're going to buy great works. And I think that is where generosity or spirit comes in. Mm. Like when Kiran was talking about this major show. Yes. I mean, every collector at some point in time, whether they see it or not, mm. especially if you have invested a lot of time, effort and money, yes. validation is good. An example for an important show like that, if Kiran and her curator phone up, Mm. and they take three works of all three artists. I mean, mm. that is something that's very generous mm. and that's also something that is very satisfying and you can't say no. Yeah. At least you know you're on the right track. Yeah. You guys have taken quite a few works yeah. for this show yeah. and that gives you the courage, the confidence yeah. Yeah. to try and move forward rather, <laughs> yeah, rather than stopping. Mm. And the last thing, at least for living in a place like Bombay where real estate is mm. paramount, at some point you have to bring in discipline. Yes. So what I've started to do now is that I'll only buy something if it's good enough to immediately go on the wall mm. and take down something that's already mm. pretty mm. good. So some mm. discipline you have to bring in somewhere. So on your point, actually, we, we saw some of the, a few of the works that we loaned from you actually in Kiran's show, the Sketch yes. Terrain's show. That I, Raza. Had, I had borrowed yeah. quite a few works from uh, uh, Nara, who, yeah. which are also in... One or two of them also in this show. Yeah, yeah. So both, both the Razas were there. Yeah, and yes, and they're both yeah. here. So. so you can see the the sort of community that's yes. forming. You know, time more. Sorry, I'm lost. <laughs> <laughs> we had so many ideas. Coming. Like how how did you like with the visual art collection? How did you once you had started that process? You know, what what do you when you after you've got like twenty, thirty, fifty works, you know, when you look at it, what did you, did you of discover? One artist, uh, oh, <laughs> is it general? <laughs> like, or, or did you see, for example, you really like this artist or you like this subject? You know, I try, I, I always try to uh, form a discipline and, and, mm. and, 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 tr and, you know, a structure and say, I'm, I'm missing this or yeah. these are the gaps in my collection. And then I don't follow it at all. Um, I go entirely on, on, on instinct. <laughs> um, so, uh, unfortunately not. I think it's, I think part of the pleasure of collecting is, um, you know, is the, pa is the passion for discovery. Mm -hmm. um, especially if you're collecting more historical or uh, modern things. And, you know, I'm, I, I'm always just super excited to, to, to receive a catalog or, you know, to, to, to hear about a, an exhibition or a sale uh, because you don't know what you're going to find inside it. And then all of your ideas of being disciplined or focusing on a certain period or a certain artist just, just go, go out, out the, the window. So, yeah, the amount of times I've heard, do you really need another Sousa? Um, but you just can't help it because you've seen it printed in a book or you've, you, you know that there was a certain style and you've always been excited to see it uh, be available for, for, for purchase and then it shows up. And so I, I, I'm awful um, in, in that regard. So uh, we're going to open it up to the audience uh, soon, but I'd just like to end with, with the panellists. One, one question, I think, and it's a question that was actually given to me by some member of the audience, you know, uh, can one still start collecting now? And what would your, your sort of suggestion be for, for a new collector that says, OK, I'm going to start collecting like the Indian modern? And Rajiv has just said it's still possible. <laughs> I would follow Rajiv, Dara, and uh, <laughs> Kiran. So do, do what they do. <laughs> I think it's still possible because if you look at Indian prices, yeah as compared to, um, let's say, Chinese mm -hmm. or Western art, it is still at a level that you can enter. But uh, you need to educate yourself, mm -hmm. certain amount of self-education, mm -hmm. and, um, and then let your instinct do the talking. Mm -hmm. I think instinct, play, at least in my case, it played a big role. Mm -hmm. And I think your instinct uh, can guide you if you like a work, mm. you, must, you must like the work. You must be able to live with that work. I think then you can enter mm. and start uh, appreciating it. Yeah. Yeah. Because if you're a collector, I think the work is, is not just an artwork. It's like part of your life. Right? Exactly. So, so you have that's to what live you mean with by that. you have to live, live with, with it. that work. Not just that it's a big work or yeah. it's a famous yeah. work. Right. Yeah. That's good. Dara? I have a slightly different answer. Yes. I think it's going to be very difficult to build a great Indian modern collection unless mm. you're a multi-billionaire yeah. or you've got hedge funds and I must tip my hat to the Americans because what we hear 
from the auction houses mm. and data find out by name. They're coming in and starting right at the very top, $2 mm. million, $3 million works. Mm. But I think for a normal person to build a great modern collection is not going to be easy. Mm -hmm. And I don't think they can do it the way we did, Keep make some mistakes, buy what you like, let's see. Mm -hmm. You can't do it at today's prices. So mm -hmm. two, three tips for them. One is you'll have to read, I think, more than some of us have read. Mm -hmm. Two is go out and find a proper good art c consultant or expert who you can trust. Mm -hmm. Three, don't take as long as we did to make friends with the people in the auction houses who are today <laughs> some of our dearest <laughs> friends, so become friends with them faster. <laughs> <laughs> very, very practical <laughs> suggestions. Yeah. Yeah. And fourth is, if you want to build a great collection, I would say look at paperworks because there is this phobia in India yeah. that paper will not last. Yeah. Uh, it's not as uh, valuable. And I think if you can get great works, it doesn't matter if it's on paper or it's on canvas. Mm. So try and get some great works on paper, going to be more accessible mm -hmm. and easier to do. Mm. But Dara, I think the question was, how can you enter the market? Not how can you build a great collection? No, no, no. But so, I, so you have to first enter the no, market no. before you can build it. Okay. So then I have a separate, <laughs> I have a slightly different answer. Yeah. Most of our artists, leaving aside Tayyab and Gaitonde, have yes. been extremely prolific. Yes. I would say be careful if you're just entering the market without being careful, mm -hmm. because you can end up spending a lot of money having a lot of ordinary to okay works. Mm -hmm. So then be careful, then don't mm -hmm. enter is my mm -hmm. answer. Mm -hmm. If you're entering, be careful, look for good stuff. And we didn't need to think that, oh, what will it be 10 years later? But yes. if you're going to enter at these prices, then you better think because if you don't, and I've seen, the problem is that if you have too many works of art, what you like, you don't want to sell, and what you don't like, you can't sell. Mm. So you don't want to get into that. <laughs> That's the, the, the paradox, yeah. the contradiction, so, the end thing. So my, since you're asking for advice, I'm saying be careful. Don't just enter blindly. Thank you, Dara. It's a wonderful suggestion. Raji? So, um, uh, first of all, uh, as, as Kiran said, you know, you're not going out to build a world cast collection from day one. Today, that would be hard uh, unless you were willing to spend millions. But certainly, the Indian art market, um, uh, if you look at it in its entirety, within the progressives, uh, there is a lot of art that is not that expensive. It may not be the ones, the, the works that will go into a museum, but you know, you're not trying to start a museum either. You're trying to engage with art and, and, uh, and engage with a piece of, uh, of uh, India's history in, in, in a meaningful way. So I think, you know, the first thing I would do is, you know, get, uh, unfortunately because there are not that many museums where you can go and see the art, is to get a lot of the auction catalogs going back, you know, 10, 15 years and just study the catalogs just to train your eye, you know, to train your eye on all these artists you know, they're good works, they're, they're me mediocre works, they're amazing works, but it'll, it'll help you just you know, get your eye trained. Um, the second thing that I would uh, uh, do is, uh, is to basically <coughs> look, at, uh, look at art differently in terms of, you know, to the extent that Indians are uh, much more focused on the in investment aspects of this is to look at art as a category, as an asset category in its own right. Yeah, most Indians, just as most Indians are not collectors, they're also not aware of the fact that for uh, a typical successful person in New York, perhaps 20% of their uh, net worth uh, is in art. You know, for an Indian, you know, he'll spend 20% of his net worth on his daughter's wedding. But, you know, but, you know when it comes to buying a uh, painting, you know, then he'll go and buy a drawing by Picasso, uh, you know, uh, which is uh, a print of a drawing by Picasso, uh, you know, for, uh, uh, you know, at some uh, um, duty-free shop. So, uh, <laughs> you know, so between this and that, you know, there is a, there's a happy medium. The, the reality is that, you know, the way I define the good life the good life deserves to have a lot of art in it. Uh, and, um, and, you know, if you have the wealth to afford art, you know, you have the means to actually put a significant portion of your net worth into art. You know, the returns you'll get from that are probably greater than the returns you get from anything else that you do. Uh, because the returns are psychic, but they are real, and they are fabulous. You know, I mean, art ultimately enlivens our, our lives and you know, and that uh, that joy is absolutely priceless. 
So, you know, so the second, so the real advice is, you know, think big, or bigger than you're used to thinking. Bravo. <laughs> so, I think uh, the audience can see, it's very clear why I have these panelists on the stage as the director of a non-profit museum. <laughs> they're, they're the people that we love around us. We have a little bit of time to open it up uh, to the audience for, for questions. And please, you know, it's, it's very rare. This is an incredible sort of gathering. Please raise up your hand. And, and uh, we have people who are having mics on both hands, uh, both sides of the stage. Please uh, wait for the mic so that we can hear you. Uh, also, because the event is being live cast. Questions, please? This one, I think, on that side. Yeah, please identify yourself. Hi. Okay. Hi, I'm Sakshi Talwar, and I think this was a fabulous event. So my question is for uh, Ms. Kiran Nader. What advice do you have for an emerging artist like myself? <laughs> <laughs> That's a tough piece. <laughs> uh, look. For every artist that comes into uh, the field of, of art, uh, the success rate isn't huge. So that's something that you have to be aware of. But on the other hand, I think the joy that an artist gets out of expressing themselves should far compensate for the lack of success or the or the gaining of that success. So it's very difficult to advise an artist because what is driving that artist into the field of art is something only that person knows. If they're not, uh, I don't think they're doing it with a commercial return when an artist comes into uh, the line of art. Uh, that is an added advantage if it happens. But I think you have, to, an artist must enjoy their work and focus themselves on um, producing work that is unusual and that is not sort of representative necessarily of another artist's work. So originality. Thank you. And then, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. The, yeah. The lady in front and then next to Just a follow-up to uh, that please, question. Could you identify yourself? Please? Oh, I'm Carrie Eldridge. I'm the owner of Ato Gallery. Um, my question is a follow-up to the artist's question. What would your advice be to the artist that also wants to do all of that and is doing that, but also needs to eat and feed themselves? And I honestly feel like the industry is so almost programmed to force artists into poverty for years, even a decade or more after getting an MFA, after going into several hundred thousand dollars of debt. What is your advice to help them decide how do they actually survive while creating this beautiful art and financing all of it? Is that to me? <laughs> I think the panel should. I think somebody should else should take this. Yeah, part. maybe one of you could respond no, first. <laughs> well, not to be mean or cruel, but starving artists make the best artists. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because you know, when you are reaching deep down inside your soul. And, you know, and there's no food on the table, sometimes that's when the best art gets created. And that's, by the way, one of the reasons why the progressives did so, the, you know, some of the best art they produced was in their early years, because there was no money in art. You know, they were just, they were doing art because that it was a compulsion for them. That's all they really wanted to do. And uh, the fact that they made no money from it uh, was, um, uh, 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 did not uh, uh, sort of deter them. So, unfortunately, you know, that's the nature of great art. That's a kind of, for one of a better word, million dollar question. Because in other art forms, I, I used to work in theatre, and we would always say, why is it that Eastern Europe, commun the formerly communist Europe, you know, produced such incredible theatre in the 20th century? And we were always very guilty in, in sort of whispering, you know, maybe they were it's because it was so bad that, that you know, they could produce this incredible thing for $10 uh, because that was the reality. There was no $11. There was only $10. You know. 
Uh, not that it's, a, it's an ideal condition, but I think that it's, it's interesting that in other areas of art, the same sort of question does come out. Uh, another question? In the centre here? I'm sorry, I hope I've seen it right. Come the man. Please identify yourself. Hi, my name is Devottam. Um, first of all, wonderful, really. Um, enjoyed listening to each and every one of you's personal journey. Um, as connoisseur collectors, and of course, there's a strong element of interest in art history. Uh, advice for the budding collectors, we've discussed a little bit. Your own views on the issue of fakes and forgeries. How does one kind of combat that? And what would your advice be to the young aspirational collectors who are spending time, effort, looking to invest in art, even as an alternative asset class? But how does one go about that? Some advice Maybe and that. views yeah. from all of you. Thank you. So I think one of the things that at least I would presume most of us are now lucky is that the kind of art that we would look to buy can't be fake and can't be forged because you're looking for something better than you have. It will be in books, it will be in exhibitions, stuff like that. But one thing is I find that collectors are actually, and I, I feel bad saying this, but I think they're actu act some collectors are actively looking to get fooled. They know what is the price of a big manjeet. They know what is the price of a real Akbar Metascape. They're getting it for a fraction of the price, and they're buying it. So I think the first thing is we can't just hold the people who are doing it responsible. We have to hold ourselves responsible. If you're getting something that looks too good to be true, it's 99% going to be that. So better be careful. Uh, ask for provenance. And just going and getting some signature from some artist's relative who or from some foundation or from some gallery who represented the artist but not that work, that's not going to fly. And I think people have started trying to honestly misuse auction houses, put it in for sale. It doesn't sell, but then you can go to gullible people and say, oh, it was in the XYZ catalog, and those people then buy it at the normal market price. Uh, and then really get fooled. So I think auction houses need to be very, very careful on what they are taking. And I think earlier it was that if it looks correct, let's take it. Now it should, uh, I mean, let's not take it if it looks wrong. Now I think at these values they need to say that we have to be 110%. If it's 100%, let some other auction house take it, but we ain't going to take it. So I think that's where people need to be quite careful. And everyone knows that there are particular artists and particular periods where the forgeries are happening as we speak today. And better be very, very careful about that. Any other? So yeah, we've, I, I mean, I, uh, because I collect a lot of Pakistani art, and this is unfortunately a, a constant problem. I think uh, I spend as much time um, researching provenance and asking questions about provenance um, as I do uh, looking at the work and appreciating the work. And I think that that's where some of the things that, that uh, the other panelists have talked about, relationships with uh, people in the industry, um, in the, the selling industry, so galleries, auction houses, so on and so forth, um, any and all publications, particularly all the publications you can get your hands on, um, getting access to Dara's library of unread books, um, things, <laughs> you know, spending a lot of time and effort on, on that, I think, is, in, in, in a sense, that's also very rewarding because um, at least when it comes to Pakistani modern art, you're doing as much investigation um, as you are um, uh, purchasing and appreciating. Um, and again, on provenance, I think like as a collector, one of the joys of living with um, things from another period is the history of where they've been and who else has lived with them and what else they were living with. Um, so it actually, uh, some of the work isn't, uh, isn't a chore. It actually adds to the pleasure of owning the work because you know, many people have owned it before you possibly. Um, they've lived with other works. And again, they're going to now, you know, for, for a brief period, they're going to live in a different place. Um, so spending a lot of time learning about their history as much as you can is, 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 is a really good investment. Mm. And of course, you know, documented provenance increases also the value. But yes, of course, the, and, you know, of course not always uh, well, documented provenance doesn't always exist. So yeah. I, I think 
in, with Indian modern, um, many of the galleries that were selling this are still around. Mm -hmm. And the, the, these artists, their works, are, they, they also happened to all live till they were 90 or, or, or 100 um, in a couple of cases. So a lot of that provenance work was done for you. Uh, but there may be, you know, you might be collecting Bangladeshi art or Sri Lankan art or Pakistani art. So from the region where the artist estates and, and, and the artists themselves weren't around to see that art become as successful as it has. Many, the gallery culture wasn't as old or as established. Um, and in that, in that sense, all you can do is, is, is not just obviously look at the work yourself, but, but learn about where it's been um, since it was created. Um, one small tip. Be very careful when you hear the provenance bought directly from the artist. Okay, because that's most of the time not going to be true. I mean, okay, you bought something directly from Hussein and stuff like that in the 50s and 60s and those guys, it's one thing. Suddenly some major big size work from 1980 pops up and says bought directly from the artist and there's nothing else, just don't touch it. I think there's a lady. Please identify yourself. Yeah, I'm Harul Hinson, and I was wondering, what do you think about collecting artists uh, from the modern era who are not, the, let's say, the top artists? But um, and some of the names escape me. But for instance, there's an artist called Shanti Shanti Dave, um, or others, let's say, whose work appeals to you, and you might be able to buy that as oil on canvas versus work on paper of a bigger artist. Do you have any thoughts on that, on the smaller or less well-known artists of that period? Yeah. I think the first principle is that you know, if you love a work and you can afford it, you've got to buy it. So it doesn't matter who the artist is. And even if it's an unknown artist, and Shanti Dave is a well-known artist, but, um, but absolutely. But in general, I would say that you know that is absolutely a, a great avenue to uh, you know to to start in terms of building a uh, an, a collection because you know India didn't didn't just produce you know six or eight great artists in 70 years um, you know these I think are among the greatest but you know there are others who deserve to be collected as well so uh, you know so when you look at Western art there are thousands of artists. There are thousands of artists going back to you know last 500 years, and then there are thousands of artists just you know in the 20th or 10, uh, 20th century, uh, and um, uh, nobody says, well, you know, I'm not going to collect this guy because everybody's supposed to collect only Picasso and Matisse. Uh, so there's no reason to believe that you know that the only artists in India worth collecting are the progressives. There, there's obviously a huge range outside of that. And also one more thing if I can add is buying the finest works of any artist is going to be much, much better than buying a normal run of the will work, run of the mill work of even the most famous of artists. And in the West we've seen that artists who normally sell for maybe half a million, one million, when that one great work comes out and you and we haven't even heard of that artist suddenly does twenty million, twenty five million. Mm -hmm. So that I think is important. Try and get the best you can get and then hope for the best. <laughs> we have time for one final question. At, right at the back. The I don't need a mic. Uh, no, we, we, because we are webcasting, so we need you to speak to the mic. Please I, identify I, I, yourself. Good evening. My name is HP. I don't need a mic, really. But uh, and I wish I asked my question earlier, because so many people ask great questions, so a lot of my uh, questions got answered. Uh, but since you get I'm one nine, question. I will answer, ask you one question. Can art be great in the present, or does it always have to have a seatbelt of history and culture and imperialism? Sorry, could you repeat it? I didn't. Cannot. Yeah. Can art be great in the present? Can I make great art today? Or, like fine wine, do I have to get old and gray and dead <laughs> for it to be worth anything? Yeah. Thank so you. you can make great art. You can make great art in, in the today, because a lot of contemporary artists who are coming out of India, some of them are really, will be the masters or the moderns of tomorrow. And so therefore, 
you don't have to be gray and moldy to to, <laughs> to make great art. Yeah. Yeah. So if you feel that you're going to make great art, please go ahead. <laughs> there is one more aspect to this, which is that new media are being uh, you know constantly created. You know, uh, more most recently, uh, I was privileged actually to see an artwork. Um, I was at Burning Man a couple of weeks ago. And uh, there, was, there was an artwork that involved a thousand drones. So, you know, so this is a nighttime, this is a nighttime spectacle, and you can see it on YouTube. And, um, you know, the music starts, and then these thousand drones, they come out of a cone, seemingly, and they just spread out into the night sky, and they do their thing in coordination with each other. You know, the lights change, and they flutter, and they move together, and then they move apart. It's an incredible sight. Uh, it's a new art form. So, you know, so along with creating potentially great art on canvas or on stone or, or bronze, there's a potential for new media that are constantly happening. Thank and just one thing, you said, can great art be made in the present? The answer is yes. It's luck whether you need to be gray and moldy before it gets recognized as great art or not. <laughs> and just to add to Rajiv's point of new media, the Kirnada Museum of Art currently has a show of new media art, which is part of the museum collection. So we have about 50 bucks in the show, and they're all from various artists who do video, new media of all kinds, and it is a show that is really getting a lot of popularity from the public. So there is scope. And the brilliant point to end that from the moderns we end with the here and now with the contemporary, with as Kiran says, you know, the artists who will be the moderns of uh, the future. So thank you all. And first, a round of applause for our wonderful <laughs> panelists.